reading from the book of Revelation. I, John, saw an angel come down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the abyss and a heavy chain. He seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, which is the devil or Satan, and tied it up for a thousand years and threw it into the abyss, which he locked over it and sealed so that it can no longer lead the nations astray until the thousand years are completed. After this, it is to be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones. Those who sat on them were entrusted with judgment. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshiped the beast or its image nor had accepted its mark on their foreheads or hands. They came to life, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Next, I saw a large white throne, and the one who was sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. I saw the dead, the great and the lowly, standing before the throne, and scrolls were opened. Then another scroll was opened, the book of life. The dead were judged according to their deeds by what was written in the scrolls. The sea gave up its dead, and death and Hades gave up their dead. All the dead were judged according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the pool of fire. This pool of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the pool of fire. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verbum Domini. <clears throat> Here God lives among his people. My soul yearns and pines for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest, in which she puts her young. Your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed they who dwell in your house, continually they praise you. Blessed the men whose strength you are, they go from strength to strength. Dominus Fobiscum, Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam, Gloria Tibi Domine. 
Jesus told his disciples a parable. Consider the fig tree and all the other trees when their buds burst open. You will see for yourselves and know that summer is now near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Amen, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Verbum Domini. Jesus encourages us here in Luke's Gospel that he's speaking about the time, end times, and his words will not pass away, that there is a plan that God has for the world, for us, of course, and that we need to trust God. We need to believe in his words. We need to follow him. We need to follow the Lamb. And I've, uh, it's been good for me personally to meditate upon these readings from the book of Revelation that we've had. And it's been kind of curious to me why it is something comforting about it. It, it ends with the wedding feast of the Lamb and the holy city, Jerusalem, not today, but the following verses from chapter 21. You know, the heavenly Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a bride ready to meet the bridegroom, you know. And it's, it's comforting that there is a plan that God's in control, that he is leading us. And Revelation is full of imagery that's hard to understand and things. But if you can get a, a good commentary and read about it and meditate upon it, you see great hope. You see God's power, his grace at work, that God is truly with us and he's leading us. You know, in times of stress, you know, we can be tempted humanity to trust in things other than God, big government or whatever, you know, trying to control the future. But it's really only God that's the Lord of history. Only he is in control. And that is where we can find our peace. Today, we have uh, chapter 20, <clears throat> and we see the angel coming down and with this big, great chain, and he sees this, the dragon, the ancient serpent, the devil, Satan, and he bounds him, binds him up for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit. And, but we know it says that until the thousand years were ended, then he'll be let out for a little while. You know? <laughs> great, you know, he's gonna be let out for a little bit. <laughs> but a thousand years, St. Augustine saw as the era of the church. A thousand years, a long, time. He'll be let out for a little while is that just before Christ's second coming, there's a final unleashing of the evil one, you know, to wreak havoc. And during this thousand years, we don't have this section today, verses four through six, but he has this vision of the thrones in heaven and those given authority to judge, you know, around the throne. And some see this as the saints that through confession, you know, and through the sacraments, as we grow in holiness, especially confession, but the Eucharist too, where we're venial sin is wiped away, we're liberated from sin, you know, that in confession, there's a certain binding that takes place there of sin, that we have victory over sin through the sacraments and through confession, in particular, I, had a, I talked to a gentleman recently that wanted to become Catholic, and he, he said he wanted to become Catholic because he wanted victory over sin. He wanted to go to confession, you know, to experience that victory, that triumph over personal sin in his life. He, didn't, he was tired of living as he was living, you know. And I thought, right on, you know, that's exactly why you become Catholic, right? You have the, the truth. You have a, a, a victory over sin. I felt like I had to break the news to him, though, that we oftentimes repeat our sin, you know, in confession. We have to go back. <clears throat> but we definitely see a growth in different virtues as we struggle against sin. 
But those who have this authority to judge or this victory, they have not worshiped the beast or the image or received its mark in its forehead or its hands. They came to life <clears throat> and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And they came to life. I love that. You know that you know he speaks here of a, a second death, which is damnation. That first death is sin. The first resurrection is Jesus. That second resurrection we could speak of mentioned here is his second coming where the world is renewed where we receive the resurrection of our body you know came to life that Jesus gives us this life so he verses 7 and on he goes on to speak of the attack you know of evil and surrounds the camp of the saints and the beloved city <clears throat> that during this thousand years of error, Satan is chained, his power is limited. You know, he doesn't, I mean, if he had just full authority to do it, he'd kill us, right? He'd take our life. He could do that. But there's some limit to what he can do. He can surround the camp, he can wreak havoc, he can cause us a lot of trouble until the second coming where he is, you know, permanently put into hell. And then we speak in verses uh, 12, it speak of the book of life, the dead are judged according to their works as recorded in the books, you know, what we've done, you know, in our life. And, and there's this judgment of a second death, this damnation that, you know, we have either two ends that are possible, heaven or hell. And then chapter 21, we see this beautiful description of a new heavens and a new earth. First heaven, first earth has passed away, the sea is no more. The holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We see that <clears throat> the catechism in speaking about the end times in uh, paragraph 680, it says, Christ the Lord already reigns through the church, but all things of this world are not yet subjected to him. And we can open the papers, so to speak, and see that. There's a lot of havoc, a lot of chaos, a lot of sin going on. The triumph of Christ's kingdom will not come about without one last assault by the powers of evil after that thousand years. And at the second coming, Christ comes in glory to achieve the definitive triumph of good over evil. And before this second coming, a final trial will happen that shakes the faith of many believers. There will be a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. Catechism speaks of the figure, the Antichrist will glorify himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. You know, we can succumb to that temptation in our personal lives just to put ourselves on the throne, to be a little more self-centered. You know, we give Satan more entry and work in our life when we do that. But certainly at the end, there'll be this dramatic, speaks of a religious deception that offers an apparent solution through apostasy, through turning from God, you know, this figure and the deception of the devil will offer us something, you know, the temptation of Jesus in the desert, you know, turn these stones into bread, then you'll have followers, you know, that, you know, look at the kingdoms of this world, you'll have them if you bow down before me, that that is always a temptation present in our history. So the church will only enter the glory of the kingdom through this final Passover, when she will follow the Lord in his death and resurrection, that the, the kingdom will be fulfilled not by a historic triumph, that we see the kingdom grow visibly more and more till the world is perfected, so to speak, but only by God's final, his victory over the final unleashing of evil which will cause the bride to come down from heaven. His triumph over evil comes at the last judgment. 
So this final judgment, the separation of the sheep from the goats, is a victory over evil. And I think, you know, we're warned in the gospel not to judge. And there's, there's something that we want a, a better world, right? And we want to make these judgments. Now, we try to judge people's hearts. We can't do that. But there's that tendency that there's got to be a divine justice here. There has to be a day of reckoning. That's natural, you know, to see that. If God is good and all-powerful, there has to be this final last judgment. And that is his fully conquering of evil, to cast Satan into hell. And, and sadly, some who have chosen, you know, not to believe in Christ, not to uh, follow the light they've been given in their consciences, you know, they've chosen not to go to heaven, right? And, and we could say in a sense. This new heavens and a new earth that's spoken of is a, another great encouragement here. We know in Romans 8.22, we're told that the whole of creation has been groaning with travail. And Paul says, not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit as we await the adoption as sons, the redemption of our own bodies. So at the second coming, we have the bodily resurrection, but all of creation has fallen with original sin. You know, we can see <clears throat> uh, just, you know, death and, you know, there's all kinds of natural disasters and all these things that all the animal kingdom suffers. And, you know, we can see this yearning for something better, something more perfect. Some theologians have spoken of the natural priesthood of man that even before the fall were given the Garden of Eden to till and keep and to offer this world to the Father. So there's a certain commonality to our destiny and all of creation, right? Because we're supposed to be tilling and keeping and offering this to the Father. So our final destiny is very much linked to the rest of creation. Now we're the high point of visible creation. Angelic beings are personal beings. We are human beings made in the personal beings as well, made in the image and likeness of God. We can merit grace and glory because we have free will made in his image. We're destined to be glorified. And, but we also speak as a certain, of a certain perfection of glory that will be added to creation, not merited by creation, but the world will be renewed. That's the way the scriptures speak of it, a renewal, that there will be something even above nature that will be added to creation. Man's destined to be glorified, to share directly in the glory of God because we have a soul, but we, in a sense, we're robed with creation, right? And so that it's fitting that St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that the, the dwelling that we live in should, should be raised up as well. It befits the, the dweller, he says. And that as we're made up of these elements of the natural world, our bodies are, so these elements are transformed in us, experiencing glory, uh, so will the entire natural world. That Thomas says that even man by his senses will perceive God in the most clearest of ways through the renewal of creation. So God, where Jesus comes, the second coming with glory and his saints, you know, the, the world will be cleansed of sin, including the natural world, and raised up and offered to the Heavenly Father. That's a beautiful thought. That's a beautiful thought. We can see, certainly, the beauty of creation today points us to God, shouts to us of a creator. And what about a, a transformed world, a brighter world, a world that radiates God more clearly? That's what we're destined for. That's what our senses are used to. So our heavenly life will have that in some way. It's a, it's a beautiful teaching, and it will manifest God to us even more clearly. 
It's all good, man. It's all good. We're destined for something so beautiful that God is at work. He has a plan for us. He's leading us. That the chaos we see is not out of God's control in some way. But as believers, we're called to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. He's leading us. He's caring for us. And our destiny is to find this fullness. The kingdom is to be fulfilled in Him in His second coming.